welcome to the first ever official Ionic Enterprise Summit. I'm thrilled to be keynoting this event. I'm so proud. And I want to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to get dressed at least once this year. Uh, it's been it's been a year, that's for sure. I hope everyone's been uh, staying safe and, uh, <laughs> you know, we're, we're making the best of it. So um, today we've got a really interesting event that is catered, I think, really well to the needs of you as an enterprise developer. So first up, I'm going to be talking about Ionic kind of where we're at, how we got here, and what we're doing next. And then you're going to hear talks from some of our amazing customers on topics like digital transformation, AR, wearables, micro front end architectures, reusable architectures, which we've been hearing a lot about from customers and, and other users, topics on product development, and a whole lot more. And then we have a very special guest, Marty Kagan, who is founder of Silicon Valley Product Group. Uh, this is a talk that you definitely will not want to miss. Uh, we have spent a lot of time with Marty. We've gone to his workshops, and I think it's safe to say that his teachings and, and <clears throat> philosophy have transformed, completely transformed the way that we build products. And if you're a developer and you feel like you aren't able to participate enough in the product development process, then you definitely will want to attend this because it's all about empowering developers to be a much bigger part of building products, not just being, um, you know, going off and, and being told what to build, but actually being an active participant. Uh, so I want to thank everyone who put in the time to make this event happen, the team here at Ionic, our customers, uh, other Ionic users, and Marty, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate it. <clears throat> so really quickly about me. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Ionic, and you can find me on Twitter at at Max Lynch, or feel free to email me at any time, max at ionic.io, not .com. I don't know that, Max. That's not me. <laughs> max at ionic.io. And I would love it if more customers and more users just emailed me. Uh, people do DM me on Twitter. I love that. So if you have a question about anything, I love to talk Ionic. I love to talk capacitor, um, this technology in general. So feel free to reach out. So today I'm going to be talking about our goal to build the best enterprise app development platform in the world. So best is a really loaded term, and that's why we underlined it. <laughs> what does that even mean? Well, for the enterprise, there's all these constraints. You've got the constraint about keeping costs low. You've got the constraint about moving quickly and shipping as quickly as you can. You've got the constraint of being able to find and hire people to actually work on the software you're building. You've got the constraint of making something good that uses your design system that looks like the rest of your other apps that can reuse code you've already built, maybe on the web. It's got the constraint of making something performant that users actually like, and all those other things. So balancing all those constraints, we think that the Ionic platform brings one of the most compelling combination of solutions to all those different problems than anything out else out there. And so that's what we mean by best. And I'm going to talk about how we balance a lot of those constraints. Uh, but before we do that, I want to just go through a quick history lesson here and talk about why we built this stuff in the first place, why we built Ionic Framework, what we built along the way, and set the stage for where we're going next. So for those of you who were around back in 2014 as part of the community, You'll remember Ionic Framework V1 came out around the end of 2013, beginning of 2014. And for us, um, you know, thinking back to why we built that project in the first place, we were both um, native developers. So we did iOS and Android development. We were comfortable writing Objective-C, comfortable writing Java, but we we're also web developers. So we were increasingly drawn to JavaScript, to browser development, um, you know, I personally, I'm a software engineer, and I have worked with pretty much most of the UI libraries out there, whether it's for native development or otherwise. I'm talking Swing on Java. Um, I'm talking like Windows Forms, uh, GTK for Linux, um, you name it. I've used pretty much every single UI toolkit out there. And I just fell in love with 
building with JavaScript, CSS, and HTML because I've never found anything that was even remotely as productive as that stack. And being able to debug, the, the quality of the debugging tools, um, I just personally loved it. So at the time, um, developers, and spe specifically web developers, were increasingly empowered to <clears throat> build at pretty much every level of the stack. So web developers were building really interactive, complicated browser-based apps. So single page apps were kind of a new thing. And web developers were proving that they could build really complicated web-based software that rivaled desktop software. They also were building desktop software with projects like uh, nw.js um, and Electron. And then they were also building high performance, scalable backend services with Node.js, projects like Express. And so JavaScript developers and web developers, what I loved about them is they kind of said, this technology is awesome. I want to use it everywhere. I think it's general purpose. And I don't want to have to switch to different languages and different UI libraries just to kind of do the same thing. And so we definitely had that attitude. And we looked at kind of what web developers weren't able to do yet or do really well. And mobile was really it, uh, despite being the fastest growing application platform out there, one of the most exciting, most promising. Uh, web developers weren't really taken seriously on mobile. And they certainly wanted to build mobile apps. And that explained the early popularity of Cordova and PhoneGap. But something was missing. Um, and for us, what was really missing is was a standard library of components that made the web apps they were building actually good and actually rival native, not just be kind of a second class experience, but really a first class experience that was high performance, could be award winning, really be flagship quality. And so we built that Ionic framework to be that thing. We built a core component set that rivaled what Apple and Google gave you out of the box. Uh, it was pretty pretty soon that we surpassed what Apple and Google gave you because in particular, Apple doesn't really give you a whole lot. Um, and that's something native developers will understand. Uh, all these patterns and paradigms that people are used to like menus, Apple didn't give you any of that stuff. So um, it wasn't soon uh, before we had kind of surpassed the standard library of the native tooling, which was fun. And, um, and back then, if you looked at like the framework world, like we needed a way to distribute components. And AngularJS was really the, the main game in town. So this was like AngularJS 1.1, 1.2. Um, a little known fact, I taught myself Angular uh, while building the first versions of Ionic. Uh, and thankfully, none of that code is still in there. So, uh, but, but that was kind of the time. So, um, so that really struck a chord. That community took it and ran, ran with it. And, and I has become a force in the mobile ecosystem, now powering over 15% of apps in the app stores, uh, really, really kind of made a big mark. So over the years, we've done a lot of things, as many of you know. Um, <clears throat> we obviously built Ionic 1, and then we uh, migrated to Angular 2. The Angular team approached us pretty early on in 2015 uh, when they were talking about the new version. Uh, we were excited about it. We were intrigued by this new thing, TypeScript. We weren't really sure where it was going to go, but we felt like it kind of added a level of legitimacy to the technology. Angular is a very serious framework, and we wanted to build very serious apps, um, and that worked out really well. But I think what's really interesting is to think about the first five years or so of Ionic's history. We really were only relevant to Angular developers. And we love the Angular ecosystem. We continue to, it continues to be our number one ecosystem. But our original goal, going back to the genesis of framework, was to build something that enabled every web developer to build mobile apps. We didn't want to necessarily get stuck in any single silo in that ecosystem. We wanted to help every web developer. So a couple of years into Ionic Framework, we started thinking about what a version that supported everything would look like. And we started working on Ionic Framework 4. And one of the big realizations we had was we could build rich JavaScript powered components, distribute them to every single web developer, uh, as long as they had a web browser, <clears throat> through the power of custom elements and the web components, essentially. And so we, we made big investments in web components. And they've paid off in the last 
two years, we've been able to actually go and support for the first time ever, the broader web development ecosystem. In particular, React and Vue, where we have not just web components running, but custom bindings and support with uh, custom routers. So there's always a little more work we have to do with specific frameworks because we want to support all the other tooling. Um, and so that's a little more challenging. We want to support the router. We want to support state management libraries. And so with React and Vue, we go the extra mile to make sure all this stuff works. But technically, you can use our components in any JavaScript um, context. And so we call that the vanilla experience. And while we don't officially support it because you're going to need things like routers and all this other stuff. And so we really recommend people use React and Vue or Angular. Um, it absolutely works. And it's a key part of um, why we built this. Along the way, we also built Ionic to be an actual business. So we wanted to build something that would actually be able to stick around and be sustainable. One of the problems with open source, uh, open source is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But one of the challenges is uh, there is a lot of project, projects don't have that sustainable nature behind them. So they can't keep investing in it. And so for us, we knew pretty early on that if we made this really popular, successful framework, we would find ourselves in a whole bunch of really interesting use cases that were what we'd consider enterprise class. So apps that were having a ton of investment poured in that were mission critical for the business, we would be able to offer those teams more that would really, really help them de-risk their projects, make them more successful, and kind of go the extra mile. So we had worked on a number of commercial offerings along the way, Project, products like Identity Vault, which manages secure authentication tokens, encryption keys, using the very powerful uh, but also incredibly complicated um, security APIs and hardware on modern devices. So storing tokens encrypted at rest, enabling biometric unlock, of those, but in a way that can't be bypassed through uh, through a jailbroken device. Um, AuthConnect for doing easy single sign-on with enterprise authentication sources, drop it in, connect to Azure Active Directory, ping identity, Salesforce, et cetera. And then AppFlow, which has been around for the longest um, and predates some of this in some of its early forms. And that's a cloud build service for Ionic apps. So being able to run cloud builds, publish those apps to the app stores, iOS and Android apps, perform live updates, which is a superpower of this technology. Because it's based on web, you're able to do all these things. So we've been building out this ecosystem of really integrated products. Um, and we're not just an open source company. We also have this enterprise commercial layer, which is why you're all here today. And I'm going to talk more about some of that stuff in a bit. So along the way, um, kind of few projects that we did were as significant as Capacitor. I'm going to be talking about Capacitor a lot today because it's becoming kind of the cornerstone of our offering. So Capacitor is um, a kind of replacement for Cordova and PhoneGap that runs any web app, so it doesn't have to be built with Dynamic Framework, runs it on iOS, Android, desktop, and the web is a progressive web app. So this is the evolution of the hybrid approach. And I've got an interesting um, piece at the end where we talk about what we're calling these apps now, because we think hybrid is kind of the past at this point, and we're on to the next thing. Um, and Capacitor takes us there without sacrificing all the things we love about building web apps on mobile. And Capacitor is built with modern web technology, modern native technology to bring that modern web that we know and love to native. So I'll be talking a lot more about that. And none of this would be possible without the amazing contributions from the community. So when you use Ionic, you're not just getting something that we maintain as a company. We receive contributions from hundreds of developers around the world. They are stress testing this. They are finding issues in the documentation. They're helping us with security issues that they come up. We are really a you know, we're a relatively small team compared to the massive community behind the project. And so just something to think about here is I want to thank all these contributors, you know, past, present, and future. They really make this possible. So that's kind of the open source and product uh, evolution. Um, over the last two years, we have really started to build a serious enterprise business. And I want to talk about what we've built what customers are getting out of it, 
um, and where we're going with it from here. So first of all, to all of our 200 customers, I want to sincerely thank you. You have made a huge bet on this platform. Uh, you have been building amazing things that inspire us each and every day. You are the reason we are able to do this. And so I just want to sincerely thank each and every one of you. It means so much that you believe in the technology. And I want to thank you for having such a big influence in it. So we have learned and have uh, really influenced our own product roadmap so, so much from just sitting down and talking with you. So I want to thank each and every one of you. Uh, the business that we have today is incredibly healthy. We are in a very good position as a business. Uh, we are growing quickly, especially with our enterprise business. And we are building out an organization catering specifically to your needs as a medium to large enterprise or fast growing startup. We are also in pretty much every single industry on earth. Um, and it really speaks to the general purpose nature of a technology like Ionic. You can use it to build anything. You can hire from the largest developer pool out there, which is web developers. Um, this isn't a this isn't like a pr pr proprietary um, IDE or desktop product that only a small segment of the world actually can help on. It's it's web technology. You can go and hire and train any web developer to come work on the stack. And because of that, we've been able to find ourselves in industries like healthcare, insurance, services, technology, financial services, government, and banking, kind of big concentrations there. And while we're also general purpose, we are also becoming more um, industry specific or industry um, knowledgeable, I'll say. So for those in the financial services industry, we, we deeply understand kind of the use cases that you have and we're going to continue to. So we we try not to be a master of none. We really do have, um, we're building proficiencies in each area, which is exciting. So I'm going to talk about three customer, uh, highlight three customers here um, just to kind of show you what people are building, what they're getting out of the platform um, and hopefully inspire you because they inspire all of us. So uh, the first one is Amtrak. And Amtrak is one of our flagship customers. They've been with us for a long time and they have, they've built their consumer facing flagship app on iOS and Android on Ionic. And Amtrak is a very interesting story because I think they kind of show the general trend that we're seeing across the industry, which is bringing app development in house. So one of the things we like to talk about is that every company on earth is having to become a software company in some shape or form. Uh, it's not possible to move quickly enough, um, manage the the your brand, manage your experience by outsourcing development across the board. And so teams are recognizing that. That's part of why Ionic has been growing so quickly is, is we're kind of a perfect toolkit for bringing development in-house. It's easier to hire people for, uh, it's, it's cost effective. All those constraints, it balances really well. So Amtrak brought app development in-house uh, started moving more quickly, uh, started improving the level of quality of their app. Um, they're using a lot of the Ionic platform, so being able to push live updates with app flow and, and other components. So really, really thankful to have them. I want to thank the team at Amtrak. They've also had a huge impact on our roadmap and have been great to work with. So thank you so much. <clears throat> Next up is AAA. So they also have a flagship app built on Ionic 5. And one thing that's really interesting about this AAA app is it's dynamic and personalized based on the location of the user. So depending on where you are, you will get a different experience. And that's all powered through the, the power of AppFlow. So AppFlow enables them to have kind of a runtime code swapping experience that is App Store compliant, um, that is kind of natural for their web developers. So they're utilizing that feature and really getting a lot out of it. So. Uh, another great customer, I want to thank them. They've also had a huge impact on some of the stuff we're working on next. And then finally, Paylocity, cloud-based payroll and human capital management software. They've been with Ionic for a long time, uh, early Ionic users, and they're utilizing Identity Vault. And just a reminder, Identity Vault uh, is a essentially a API on top of Keychain, Key Store APIs on iOS and Android, biometric hardware, and it goes above and beyond the typical um, fingerprint 
scanner plugin you might use um, because you know you can't you can't get true uh, identity and, and JWT token encryption key security if you just scan a fingerprint and then go grab that data from an unencrypted or non uh, I call it tangled experience where the actual hardware and the biometric status code are tangled together. So they're using Identity Vault to do that in the correct way and also AppFlow. So thank you so much, Paylocity. Um, and so so each one of these customers is getting some, some value out of this platform and experience that we've built. And so I wanna just kind of walk through and enumerate what we offer. If you're an existing customer, hopefully this will be a reminder of the things that we, we offer and um, maybe there's something here that you're not yet using that you're excited about. Uh, and if you're not yet a customer, which we would love to see you become one, um, hopefully this will kind of explain what we do that's unique here um, because we have a really interesting kind of unmatched offering in the open source world. It's rare that you can use open source technology and actually call someone and get a response on the weekend to a, a serious issue. Um, you know, you can't do that with Facebook and Google, right? So we're kind of a unique, uh, a, a unique company in that regard. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the first thing that you get with Ionic is a team of mobile experts with strong iOS and Android native development experience. So going back to those constraints at the beginning, we are seeing teams really excited about building with web technology because it's easy to hire for, it's affordable, it's effective, they can build great experiences, they can use all their existing code. But those teams often have web development experience, right? Because they're web development teams. And what we're seeing with a lot of our customers is they're able to get that native development experience they need for that 10%, 5% of their experience that's gonna have deep native integration and then use their team to focus on what's unique about their app. Um, so we have developers who love Objective-C, love Swift, love Java, but also love web technology and kind of the, the intersection of all those things. So when you work with us, you gain that kind of a, a strong native development team on your side. So you can focus on hiring web developers and building a web development team for cross-platform development. We also have deep industry connections. So we have connections with teams over at Google, um, at Apple. And so if there's an issue that comes up, often we can get a kind of a, a response or uh, a, a person on, on email or phone that can help uh, in a way that could be really valuable. To use an example, we had a customer that had an issue with their app over the weekend. And it wasn't necessarily an issue with Ionic or Capacitor. Um, it was just, you know, things happen, you use an API, there's some privacy implications, et cetera. And we were able to um, kind of get connected with Google, figure out what was going on, and ended up being the bright spot of an otherwise kind of difficult experience for them. So um, that's something that we can offer. We're also web industry leaders. So we work with browser vendors, teams over at WebKit, Chrome to make sure that new APIs are added, uh, things work correctly with different APIs, uh, often around accessibility, form input experiences, things like that. And then finally, we offer user experience and design leadership. So we have seen, we work with so many customers, we work with so many apps, um, even just in the broader open source world, uh, that we've seen what works, what doesn't. We can give you user experience and design leadership that could be invaluable. Um, and so that's another thing that we offer. I mentioned our Identity Vault and AuthConnect products, but we are building out a suite of secure solutions that are fully managed on the native side. And so what that means is we build these really pretty complicated native components, native plugins that manage obscure, security sensitive, challenging APIs on the device. And, and so you don't have to worry about it. You can drop it in, focus on what's unique about your app. Um, I, I, I already kind of talked about some of this stuff, but you're able to build these web-based cross-platform teams, focus on web technology standards and not worry about, okay, how do I use the uh, keychain API to make sure I'm enabling the biometric flag correctly when I store this token and have it expire when there's an, an enrollment change. All those things, we we have a team focus on that. We keep it updated. Every time there's a new operating system update, which is 
several times a year, but at least one significant update a year, all that stuff works for you. So you don't have to worry about it. So hopefully that should remove a significant source of stress. And we are building out a a collection of these. So we focused on initially identity management, authentication, but we're expanding this to other things. And we really want your input. Um, if there's some kind of hard mobile problem that you really wish we could handle for you, please let us know because we definitely want to hear about that. So the other thing you get with, with Ionic is this fully integrated platform. So because we build the native side and we build the website, we're able to kind of fully integrate all of it so it works really well together. And this is one of the reasons why I'm going to talk at the end why we're so excited about Capacitor, but we also want to encourage people to adopt it because it's something that we we can actually fulfill this superpower with Capacitor in a way that we can't necessarily do with Cordova because we don't own that project. We can uh, influence it, we can contribute to it, but if there's something really uh, time sensitive or a significant developer experience change we wanna make, we can really do that easily with Capacitor, but we can't really do that with Cordova. So. Um, we've been building out this fully integrated experience so we can actually offer that to customers and make it kind of a, a main selling point of the offering. So the other part of this is we have really interesting features like live update that a lot of customers are using. It's kind of a superpower of the technology, being able to push updates to your app in real time because it's just web-based. So it's allowed by the app store terms of service. Um, it ends up being really, really compelling. And then finally, you get that best of both worlds with the stack where you get open source, which you're being told to use, you want to use, right? Everyone's using open source because it makes the most sense. Using proprietary front end development products just doesn't really make sense anymore. Um, so you get that with Ionic, but then you also get what we've lost in open source, which that which is that enterprise grade experience. Being able to call someone, being able to drop in code that someone else manages so you can focus on your own on your own stuff, being able to speak to a team that speaks your language. We are becoming an enterprise platform. We 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 are used to speaking to enterprise customers. We understand your needs. We we know what you have riding on these projects. We are here to help. So that brings me into the support offering kind of what we offer as a customer success and support team. So if you work with us, you have a dedicated customer success team. Uh, this team has extensive experience shipping enterprise software. We work with a lot of other customers who so were able to pool up all that knowledge and experience um, in a confidential way, of course, but able to draw on our experience working with a lot of different customers. Uh, we are, like I said, we speak your language, we understand your needs, and we have experience at every layer of the stack. So native, web, design, um, DevOps and backend, so we can help you kind of navigate that whole experience and we know what works together and what doesn't. And then finally, we have an amazing partner ecosystem. So we don't do any app development ourselves. We focus on the technology, we focus on the components that are gonna run your app, but we know teams want things like staff augmentation, uh, which is really kind of a fast growing part of the, of the consulting and dev shop world because you're bringing that development in-house, right? You're becoming a software company, you're building a software development capability. And so you wanna keep that development in-house. Um, these teams can help with staff augmentation. So you can bring in a mobile expert, bring in an Ionic expert and you know, get a jump start on your project. Or if you wanna have the teams actually build a net new app or a net new experience, which is still a wonderful option, these partners can help you do it. So uh, we have, uh, a number of partners that are fully vetted that we work very closely with. We keep them updated regularly, so they should be aware of all the stuff that we're announcing or we uh, have announced. <clears throat> and so they can really kind of accelerate uh, your next Ionic project. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, if you want to learn more about that, we just rolled out a new website, um, which is the culmination of a platform change we're making in a little bit. I've got a slide on it. Um, but if you want to learn more about the enterprise offering, get in touch with us, get a demo, go to ionic.io, not .com, that's not us. <laughs> uh, go to ionic.io and uh, request a demo. <clears throat> okay, so we've been busy as a company. I want to walk through what we've released in the last 12 months. You, stuff you may have missed. Apologies if this is all redundant or repetitive to you, I think it's important to talk about the context behind some of these updates at least. So 
The first thing we released about a year ago was Ionic React. So I talked about why it was so important for us to support other technologies, but obviously React is one of the most popular options out there. And so we looked at React and we we said, okay, well, you know, there's already a mobile option, right? You can use React Native. What's going to be different about Ionic React? Well, one of the things that a lot of people miss about React is most people are building React web apps. So React Native uses a different library than the React web projects do. So we so a web project would use the React DOM rendering library. A uh, React Native project would use the React Native rendering library. And if you go and look at the downloads of those two projects, there's like 20 times the amount of usage on React DOM than React Native. And what that said to us was web developers want to build web apps. That's what we do. We love working in the browser. We love being able to use HTML and CSS, the standard versions of them. And so we, we, we looked at that and said, you know what, there is a lot of room here for us to do something really interesting and bring a unique value prop to the React ecosystem. And, and one of those things is that it just works with everything you're already used to in React. So React Native only supports a small subset of libraries that support that rendering engine. But with React, Ionic React, you can use every popular React library. Uh, you can drop in any component you know, component that you find, as long as it supports React DOM, it's going to work just the same. You can build iOS and Android apps, you can build Electron apps, you can build progressive web apps. Uh, it does it all with one code base. So you don't have to switch different code bases for different platforms. And like, I've become a React developer personally. So, um, you know, I try to look at Ionic React through an unbiased lens, which can be hard. <laughs> but uh, when I do try to look at it that way, I think, Okay, is this the type of React experience that I would expect from a different React component library? And the answer is yes. We have designed this to be a native React development experience and have all those benefits you're already used to with Ionic. So the 100 plus components, it's the same components as in Angular, as in Vue, because we have that kind of cross-platform, cross-framework web component layer. So all the components are the same. All right, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge React fan. I definitely hope you check it out. Um, and you, I think you'll find it's a it's true to the React experience that you'd expect. And that brings me to Vue. So Ionic Vue has been one of the most highly requested integrations ever for, for us. Uh, we have a joke, we had a joke, a running joke, because anytime we'd tweet anything, we would get 100 responses saying, when's Ionic View coming? When are you going to support Vue? <clears throat> and I, it's just a testament to the popularity and um, uh, kind of the appeal of Vue that it's become so popular. When I think about why why is Vue so popular, I think about AngularJS 1. And I and I, I think of back to like why people loved AngularJS 1 uh, and what was so special about it. And, and, and it was really that you could go and take a typical web page and enhance it with a whole bunch of really amazing functionality. So in our case back then, we could add custom components that you drop into any template and they magically turn into like new HTML tags that we just invented, which you can do today with web components. But back then that was really kind of a novel thing. So Vue feels like it took the best parts of AngularJS and made a few significant deviations from Angular 2, which I'm not going to say they're better or worse. It's just a different type of value proposition and built something that really appeals to developers who like that kind of progressive enhancement or progressive adoption capabilities that AngularJS had. So uh, we love Vue. And, and, and when we, we were looking at supporting it, um, we obviously knew that Vue 3 was coming. We didn't want to build something on Vue 2 that we'd have to rewrite because we'd been there before. It's not fun. It's a lot of work for us. We wanted to focus on the future of Vue and build for Vue 3. Um, and that's what we did. And we are actually one of the first UI libraries that fully supports Vue 3. So I'm, I'm glad we did that because um, unfortunately, I think a lot of other libraries are uh, finding the upgrade path, the migration path to Vue 3, not as easy as they were hoping. So um, we went straight to Vue 3. That could be a little cutting edge for what you need, but just keep that in mind. That's That's what it supports. And it's the standard view experience. So it works with all the view libraries, you know, the routers, everything like that. We've also been doing a ton of updates on framework accessibility. Um, 
thanks to a key customer who has really had a huge impact on on making sure Ionic is as accessible as possible. We've done a ton of updates. If you want to take advantage of these, make sure you're running the latest version of Ionic Framework on GitHub. Um, but something else to keep in mind is we also work on accessibility and web API advocacy around uh, things like input focus and everything like that. So we're not just making framework accessible. We're also making sure the browsers work with the accessibility work that we're doing. So um, want to thank our key partner who helped out there. Um, if you want to take advantage of these, make sure you're running the latest of framework. So I've talked about Outflow a bunch today, and this is our cloud build and cloud update service. So you can think of it as a mobile CI CD, mobile DevOps platform. <clears throat> we will do automated builds of your app for iOS and Android. We maintain a bunch of complicated Mac build infrastructure, so you don't have to. So managing things like Xcode versions, all the different tooling that works with it. You can pick different build stacks, we call them. So being able to say, OK, I want to target Xcode 11 um, and be able to configure the stack completely. That's a new feature that we released recently. That should have been on here, but I forgot. I apologize. Uh, in the last 12 months, we've done a ton of work on Appflow. So we've added support for iOS enterprise builds, being able to bring more of a self-hosted on-prem approach to Appflow. So it's not 100% uh, kind of classic on-prem, but a more hybrid uh, cloud uh, approach to on-prem. So you still get the benefits of cloud. You still get those benefits, benefits of us managing the infrastructure and software for you, but you get a more an experience that, that might be more compliant for your security needs. So if you looked at Appflow in the past and you felt like it wasn't going to work for some of your internal IT compliance needs, please take another look because we've made a ton of improvements there. And we're also working on a bunch of stuff uh, that I think you'll find valuable. We've also added single sign-on. So being able to have your own authentication to log in Appflow, advanced permissions. Um, <clears throat> because one of the things that Appflow lets you do is basically release code live. And so teams find they want more control and more permissions over that. So we've added a bunch of stuff there. And we've made it more scalable. So we are working with companies who are deploying, who are using Appflow for uh, uh, consumer experiences that you have probably used before. Uh, with many, many millions of users, huge bandwidth um, needs and all that stuff. So we've made a ton of changes to make Appflow scalable uh, and that, that's been in the last six or so months. So definitely take a look there. It's becoming a key part of our offering. A lot of our customers are getting a lot of value out of it. And again, that live update feature is a superpower. If you're not using it, um, I think it's fair to say you're missing out because it will transform the way you build mobile apps. So the native solutions I've talked a lot about um, and so I, I don't, I'm not going to enumerate all those things again, because you're probably sick of me talking about Identity Vault, but um, Identity Vault, we added a bunch of new updates recently, uh, kind of new Android features and some other things that people wanted. So being able to fall back to the system pin, supporting new Android face and Iris unlock, new hardware is coming out all the time. Android's adding new APIs, so we need to support them and we continue to do that. That also meant supporting Android X. And then we added the ability to customize a ton of the labels and design of the experience. So um, so that's been really interesting. AuthConnect, we added uh, a bunch of new providers like Salesforce, Okta, Ping, uh, you name it. Added support for PKCE web and being able to do manual key refresh. So we are working hard on these and we're also building out um, uh, new solutions. So I'll talk about that in a second. So what are we doing next? What, what's our roadmap look like? Well, the first thing I want to say is that you can influence our roadmap. And what you should expect in 2021 is that we are going to be pastoring you to actually share your experience building on Ionic because we want to build on your behalf. So if you get a message from um, you know, your, your customer success manager, from your account executive, um, or from a developer, uh, or from like a, a, a product leader at the company, just know that what we're trying to do is actually make sure we're solving the problems that you have. We have, we've been on a hiring spree. The company has grown significantly recently. We feel like we're just getting started when it comes to product for enterprise companies, but we can't do that in a vacuum. We need to talk to you. 
We need to hear about the challenges you have. We want to build solutions that are catered to the problems that you have. So please, um, we, we always appreciate and want to thank everyone who has spent a lot of time with us doing customer discovery. Uh, you are in, seriously influencing our roadmap and you have a lot of impact. Um, and we will be we will be pastoring you this year to do the same. So thank you so much. One of the big changes you can expect this year is moving Ionic from kind of a piecemeal offering where you find you know a plug in here, a plug in there, some support over there, et cetera, into kind of a more fully integrated platform. So this might not mean much to you today, but uh, this is kind of where we're going. We want you to be able to invest in Ionic, get all these benefits. They all work really well together. You can focus on what's unique to your app. And so expect a lot more updates kind of around this platform concept um, this year. So we want everything to work really well together. We want it to be fully integrated. We want it to be one platform that you're buying into. And then we have Capacitor. So Capacitor, as I mentioned, is quickly becoming one of the focal points of our entire experience. And one of the reasons is because if we go back to that original mission we had in the, in the early days, we want to help web developers build mobile apps. And at the end of the day, we don't care what they use to do it. So if you're using Ionic Framework, that's awesome. We think Ionic Framework is the best UI option for building high-performance, cross-platform, mobile-focused apps. We, 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 we still believe that. We will continue to believe that. We think it's unmatched in that regard. That being said, there's a lot of really great UI options out there today that are, frankly, like capable of building nice mobile experiences. And we don't want you to feel like you have to use our controls, our components. If you're happy with something else, let's say you're using Tailwind or Material UI or something like that, pick whatever you want to use. Maybe you already have a design system you've built out. A lot of teams are building their own components these days. Let's say you already have that component kit and you're willing to put in the work to make it work well on mobile. We're happy to have you bring all that to Capacitor. Capacitor will run those apps. And as a company, we will support all of what you're doing. We will bring the native solutions that bring so much value, app flow, all that stuff along for the ride. So you can get all the benefits if you're not using Ionic Framework. Um, so Capacitor V3 is really interesting. We, um, I like to say like, I so I built Capacitor, the first version, and the team is really going through and fixing a lot of my design decisions, which, uh, you know, I think they're coming up with better solutions for them. So V3 will will definitely be an improvement to a lot of those things. Um, and one of the big changes is um, uh, Capacitor V1, V2, what it did is provided every single plugin you might want to use out of the box. So uh, you, you kind of got everything. And one of the things that's happened with Apple and Google in the last few years is they're becoming much more critical about making sure your app is only including code that is actually using, especially when it comes to privacy sensitive APIs. You want to make sure you don't have an API in there, uh, code for an API that you're not using. Otherwise, it, it's kind of a puts you in a hard spot. So with Capacitor V3, all this stuff's configurable. You only include what you want. That involves a change to the plugin experience. So plugins are now <clears throat> going to be a little more self contained. Uh, but there's a bunch of benefits that are coming with that. So one of those being performance benefits. So today, if you use a plugin, you kind of get this web code along with it, even if you're not using it or if you're not running on the web platform. So tree shaking to make sure we're only loading that code if you're actually using it. That's one of the improvements. We're making a bunch of improvements to the CLI build and run experience. So one of the things with about Capacitor that some people really like, some people really don't, is that it tends to want to use the actual official IDEs for each platform for building and running. Um, <clears throat> some people love that experience. I happen to be one of them, which is why that's what Capacitor supported. But a lot of people like the CLI experience. So we we hear you. We are adding support for that. You're going to love it. So um, keep an eye out for that. And this brings me to something I mentioned earlier, but I want to reiterate it. We are going to be recommending strongly teams consider adopting Capacitor, uh, whether that's existing customers, future customers, open source users. And the reason why is because we are making huge investments in Capacitor, and we can actually fulfill the promises that we're making about the whole Ionic experience, or the whole Capacitor experience, in a way that we just can't do with Cordova or PhoneGap. We don't control those projects. Um, we have made pretty... Capacitor has made some pretty dramatic design 
decisions that deviate from Cordova that would not really be possible to bring into Cordova without uh, probably a significant rewrite um, <clears throat> and a bunch of breaking changes. So capacitor is our ability to actually provide this end-to-end -end fully integrated experience. We can support it. So if there's an emergency, if there's a really serious issue, we can fix it immediately and release an update. We have a level of agility, the ability to fully support it. We can build solutions that are fully integrated. We can change every layer of the stack. And then the other part of it is we just think it's it's a better experience for developers. And we're hearing that from, from users of it too, who uh, either they were on Cordova and they found Capacitor to be a breath of fresh air, or they are coming back to the technology because they wanted to build web apps, but they something about the Cordova experience pushed them away. And so we are thrilled to get people back to this approach. We're thrilled to see Capacitor be so well received. And so we are gonna be recommending Teams adopt it and we can help you transition, we can help you adopt it. So expect to hear from uh, your customer success manager or from an account executive. We are here to help you make any migration as smooth as possible. Of course, we continue to support Cordova. Um, so it's just, we, we, we don't have that level of control and we aren't able to build that fully integrated experience. So expect to see Capacitor play a much bigger role in the entire offering. And uh, trust me, I think if you, if especially with Capacitor V3, which which kind of brings a little more parity to some of the edges around the project to Cordova, um, I think you'll find the experience is really, really, really wonderful. So that brings me to something that we are working on right now that is kind of goes above and beyond Cordova, and that's Capacitor Native UI. So I'll talk a bit, a bit in a second, but I mentioned before about how we don't look at Capacitor as a hybrid app framework anymore. It's something different. And part of the reason it's different is because of efforts like this. So you may have heard my talk in June or July of at the Ionic conference about Capacitor elements. And as we started building that out, we realized that where you kind of get the biggest bang for your buck is at the native shell rather than the actual content in the pages. A sweet spot for this technology appears to be native shell, so tabs, navigation, transitions, kind of the the yeah the shell of the app, um, but having your pages be built with web content. And one thing that's really interesting about this approach that I'm so excited about is that unlike other option on other approaches that kind of do something similar, everything here is web first. So you're still just writing a web app. You're not writing a custom rendering experience for iOS or custom experience for Android. You're not using different APIs. If you're using Ionic Framework, it's literally the same Ion tabs, Ion page. But if you if you enable this feature, which is optional, you would get a native shell instead of the web rendered versions. Now we still believe the web rendered versions are wonderful and you can build high performance, great experiences, fully customize them. But we understand that uh, teams want to feel like they're able to use native controls if they have to. They're able to call these apps quote unquote native for whatever reason, because they will be. Um, and, and Capacitor and Court of Apps today are native, but this is just a different, it just changes the conversation quite a bit. So we're really excited about this. It's still early, stay tuned, but um, we've been making a ton of progress. We have demos that are fully usable that work. We just want to make sure they're stable and fully customizable and all that. So this is an example of how we kind of go above and beyond Cordova to build a kind of a different experience. And that brings me to what we're calling this technology. Uh, with Capacitor, instead of building, you know, the classic hybrid app approach, what you're building now are web native apps. Web native is really the evolution. We look at it as the evolution of hybrid apps. So building modern web apps using modern JavaScript, TypeScript, modern web APIs, things like dynamic imports, code splitting, tree shaking, all that stuff, but still having full native access, full native performance. So we take a web first approach. So there's a lot of other technologies out there, right? Like there's plenty of options for building mobile apps in the ecosystem, but there is no option that is web first. So being able to build a web app, deploy that to PWA, desktop, Electron, iOS and Android with one code base, web standards, all the web APIs you're used to, really there's no other um, uh, game. Capacitor and Ionic is kind of the, the, 
the only game in town for that experience. So web native is a web first approach that gets all the benefits of native, full native access, um, and it's universal. So you build one app running on all these different platforms. So this is an early thing. This is the first time we've ever publicly released it. If you want to learn more, we are building out an informational site. You can visit this at webnative.tech today to learn more about this approach. It's still early, but I think this is a pretty dramatic shift um, because with, with things like Capacitor Native UI, um, with, with all the changes that Capacitor brings, we really don't look at these as hybrid apps. And there's nothing wrong with hybrid apps. We love the approach, but we do think that it's time to kind of focus on the future rather than the past of this technology because you can build really great things with the web platform, amazing things, award-winning experiences. And we want to be the company that is leading up this technology approach. So still early, but check that out if you want to learn more. So I was hoping to leave a lot more time for Q&A when I did this dry run. It only took me 35 minutes, but I've been going for a lot longer. Um, <clears throat> so we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A, five minutes maybe, uh, but stick around for the rest of the event. Like I said, you're going to hear from people who are actually using Ionic to build significant things. They have a ton of to teach all of us. Um, and then Marty Kagan will be speaking, which I said is definitely do not miss that. It is life-changing, career-changing stuff. Uh, thank you so much. If you want to learn more about any of the stuff I talked about here, definitely check out ionic.io. Get a demo if you're not a customer or kind of see where we're going if you are. Um, and thank you so much for, for, for joining us today. I think the rest of the day is going to be awesome. And I'm going to open it up for Q&A with the help of Matt.